Thanks a lot. It's great. It's great to be here at the, at the Academy. Um, I'm going to talk just for uh, not that long because there are a lot of you, and if the longer I talk, the more tendency you'll have to snooze off, uh, which wouldn't be good for either of us. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, me and China. Um, I first went to China when I was 21. It was 1980. Um, I was a just finished my third year at school and had the opportunity to go to China to study uh, language, and I took it. And at that time, we had just normalized relations with China. And going to China then was pretty much the closest you could get to interplanetary travel uh, without leaving the Earth's atmosphere. Um, uh, no direct flights, of course. Uh, no texting, no cell phone, no anything. Uh, it took six hours to book a call back home. Um, so it was you know, uh, a very uh, distant experience. It, it probably you know, the sense of adventure really propelled me there. Um, and I lived there for two years at, at, at the time. The highlight of my living experience, that I don't know what your dorms are like, but I lived with seven guys uh, in a 10 by 15 foot room for a year and a half, which was an intensely intimate experience in getting to know another culture. Um, seven Chinese dudes and, and, and me. Um, and no showers, well, but about a shower once every week. Uh, no vegetables, really bad food. Chinese food is great, but the Chinese food in China in 1980 to 82 was really lousy. Um, and so I left China knowing that I really wanted to come back and, and spend a lot, of, a lot more time there. And so I, I became a journalist, and I moved back to China in 88 uh, with the Associated Press and covered the Tiananmen Square uh, uprising and crackdown, which led to my expulsion in 1989. I was kicked, China's kicked me out for two crimes, stealing state secrets and violating martial law provisions. So I was an officially designated black hand. And I thought at that point that, like, OK, all this effort I'd put into studying Chinese and learning how to read Chinese, um, I don't know if there are any Chinese people, I mean, Chinese majors here, but it's, you know, I feel your pain if you're, if you're studying the language. Um, I thought that all that effort had gone, gone to waste because they're never going to let me back in. But luckily, um, they let me back in on a short trip in 1990, again in 1991. Then I left the AP and I joined the Washington Post, and uh, I basically spent uh, about seven, eight years working in really bad places for long periods of time, which is something you're probably going to have a chance to do in your careers. Um, so a lot of time in Iraq, a lot of time in Afghanistan, um, and then four years in Bosnia. And by that time, I joined the Post. And in 1997, an opening came up in the Post Bureau in, in, in Beijing, and the Post put my name forward. And when I applied to join the paper, the Post said, do you think the Chinese will ever let you back? And of course, I said, sure, and it won't be a problem. But of course, when the Post applied, the Chinese said, no, um, we don't think Mr. Pomfret is an appropriate candidate. Um, but the Post went to back, bat for me then. And at the time, I mean, well, then US-China relations were very different than they are now. Uh, China was a, a, a much smaller power than it is uh, today. And so the Chinese basically rolled, and, and they allowed me back in. And so I moved back in 1998 and lived there from 1998 to 2004 when we moved back to the States. Um, when I was there in 1998, from that point on, I, I basically recontacted my, my classmates, these this, this, this folks the Professor Yu talked about, um, and to sort of to, to check in on them. I'd, I'd, some, of, some of them I'd kept in contact with, sort of exchanging uh, spring festival cards and things like that. But a lot of them I'd, I'd lost contact with. And, and basically, I, I, I uh, then all wrote, wrote them all a letter via the Nanjing University Alumni Association. I went to school in Nanjing. And of the 63, um, 58 of them wrote me letters back. And basically, in that letter, I proposed this idea of doing a book about them. Um, you know, can I tell your stories? And of the 63, like, I, like I said, 58 wrote me, uh, wrote me a note back. Uh, and so then I spent the next year or so um, basically interviewing them around the world, because many of them had, had left China. And I use them as the basis for, for the book on China. And so that's kind of my experience with China. What I want to talk with you a little bit about with tonight is looking at the Egypt and the Middle East issues um, in the light of sort of from a Chinese perspective. Um, and to kind of lay out an argument why I don't think this type of massive demonstration uh, that we've seen in the Middle East we're going to see in China. And, um, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to preface it with the idea that China fundamentally is, a, is, a, is an unstable political system. 
Um, if I ask any of you guys what is India going to look like, for example, taking another massive Asian power in 20 years, you can probably guess it's going to look somewhat like it looks today. Uh, it's going to have this wobbly bureaucracy. It's going to have this wacky political system. It's going to have this interesting democracy, um, fractious, et cetera. But it's probably going to be very similar to what it is today. Whereas with China, I don't think any of us in this room can really guess uh, what China is going to become. And I don't think, even think the Chinese can guess. And so I, I want to preface my remarks with that idea that we really don't know what China is becoming, and nor do the Chinese. But that said, here are a couple of arguments why uh, what's happening in the Middle East probably won't move to China, even though there are small demonstrations right now in China happening in several cities. But that said, um, this is sort of my, my, my take of, of why we're not going to see a Tahir Square in Tiananmen any, anytime soon. And that's, and that's basically, it's, it's four basic ideas. One is the economic changes in China. Uh, two is the changes in the, the really advancement in personal freedom that you see in China. Not political freedom, but personal freedom. Three, it's the fact that the security services in China f have the full support of the party state and are free to do almost anything they want. And four, I don't think you see any significant uh, fractious behavior at the top of the Communist Party, which is really key to the political future of China. So let's take them kind of in a row. Um, in 1989, I was there uh, for the Tiananmen Square crackdown, where hundreds of people died around Tiananmen Square. And for the next three years after that, from 89 to 1992, basically, the Communist Party kind of moved back in time. It had started an economic reform program in, in the late 70s, and it opened up to the West. But in 18, 1989, they really cracked down, and the people who were against economic reforms kind of took over. And from 89 to, 1989 to 1992, they really ran things in China. So 1992 rolls around, and Deng Xiaoping, who, were, who was still very much the power behind the throne in China, came to the realization, along with his people, that they couldn't continue down this dead-end road of no, no economic reform. And so Deng made this famous, now famous trip to Shenzhen, which is a city uh, along uh, Hong Kong's border, and basically relaunched China on a, on, a, on a road of economic reform and opened up the country from that moment on to about over the course of the next decade, about $300 billion in foreign investment. And he basically made effectively a kind of a social contract with the Chinese people, saying, OK, I killed you at Tiananmen Square, and that's one door you can run through. And you can still run through it, but if you do, I'm going to whack you over the head again. But if here's another door, and that door is economic development. And if you run through that door, you're going to be able to achieve untold riches for yourself and for your family and for your friends. And that is the door that millions of Chinese people from that moment on ran through. And the results that I, I, see, I saw them very up close and personal with my classmates have been extraordinary. All of my classmates graduated in 82. All of them were basically paid the, an average salary of about 150 bucks a month then. By 1998, up into the early noughts, they're all making minimum. The lowest salary was 1,500 bucks a month, but that's the lowest salary. I have several classmates who are making well over 10,000 10, US dollars a month, had cars, big screen TVs, kind of the size of this wall, um, several apartments. I mean, the amount of wealth that they'd been able to amass through this dung policy of saying, OK, you can run through that economic door uh, was extraordinary. Um, and I think that is a key issue and a key difference with the Middle East, where the generation that was on the streets in Tahir Square were well educated. Do not underestimate the educational standards of the people in Egypt. But they had nothing to do after they got that degree. Whereas China put its people to work, and it put its, had its, had its, had its, put its elite to work as well. And so the elite that was at the forefront of the anti-communist demonstrations in 89 very quickly became co-opted by the Communist Party by the mid-90s into the early noughts because there were just so much money to be made. As a corollary, corollary to that economic development, the other issue that happened in China was a significant housing reform program. In the mid-90s, in housing reform, you say housing reform, everyone's eyes glaze over and think that's really boring. But what actually happened in the cities was it allowed Chinese people to buy their own homes for the first time in their lives. And so throughout the cities, I'm not talking about the countryside, but throughout the cities, millions upon millions of Chinese people bought their own homes. And most of you in this room haven't purchased your own home yet, 
But when you have your own home, you naturally become a lot more conservative because you have skin in the game, if you will. In 1989, the people who demonstrated in Tiananmen Square had nothing to their name, as the, as the famous song went. But in 1999 and to this day, most city dwellers in China of a generally elite status have something. They have a piece of property. They have a condo. They have an apartment. They might even have a car. That naturally makes people more conservative. And that's another issue, again, that, that impacts on the potential for po real political uh, demonstrations and political instability in China. All right, so that's sort of the econ thing. Um, personal freedom is another really significant issue. When my classmates graduated in 82, they were all assigned jobs. If they wanted to go overseas, they had to beg, borrow, and steal at the police station to get a passport. When they got married, they basically had to have the approval of their work unit chief to get married. If they wanted to switch jobs, their boss had to let them go to another work unit. If they wanted to go overseas, their boss had to let them go overseas. The amount of control on their average daily life was extraordinary. Today, that's gone. That whole architecture of personal control of, of what you do is, is gone, basically. When you graduate from college in China, if somebody wants to hire you, you can, you can go over there and you can work. Getting a passport is as simple as filling out a form. As long as you can get a visa, you can go overseas. Increasingly, Chinese can get visas easily to go overseas because they're incredibly uh, big paying, big spending tourists, actually. The average Chinese in Hong Kong and in Australia spends more than the average American does when they travel to Hong Kong or, or, or Australia. So the amount of personal freedom of the average Chinese, whether middle class or upper middle class, has expanded extraordinarily. Political freedom, not at all. You go through that door, that door is the same result that you would have had in 1989. You get hit over the head. But in terms of the economic, once you now have, you now have the wealth, and now you have the freedom to do whatever you want effectively, as long as you don't meddle in politics. And so that expansion of personal freedom has really changed the atmosphere. And it's increased the support of the Chinese elite of, of, for, for its political system. They're benefiting. Right? And they're, they're benefiting. And as you see in China, interestingly, the gaps between rich and poor are really widening. So when I w went to China in 1980, it was basically a country where almost everybody was poor. In 2010, uh, when I was there you know, last, I, I lived there for four months last year, you see an enormous, significant number of rich people, a growing middle class, and a lot of very poor people. And the gaps in rich and poor are, are, really, are really, really, really amazing. But the interesting thing is the elite in China is very much supportive of this type of system because they've benefited. So that's sort of the personal freedom aspect of it. So the third issue is the security services in China. Um, like I said, the, the other option, which is political dissidence, has remained a dead end. There has been no significant loosening up. And in fact, one could argue that 2010 is as tight as 1989 was. If you look at the number of people being prosecuted for national security violations, and this is not national security, state security violations within the American context, it's within the Chinese context. It's the same amount as 1989. They've actually surpassed 1989 uh, last year in terms of people being prosecuted for state security violations. So the state security apparatus is as powerful and as hardline as it's ever been in China. Their budgets continue to, continue to increase. And in fact, now the China's state security budgets, correct me if I'm wrong, is bigger than the People's Liberation Army budget. So the internal security has become an enormously important excuse me, uh, part of the maintenance of the communist regime. So on one hand, you have this whole, it, these policies, personal freedom, economic reforms, to give people something to do, to allow them to really to become the agents of their own fate, to actually succeed in China. But at the same time, you also have the party very much focusing on ensuring that those who decide to go through that door meet a very nasty end. Uh, and, and so, sort of, you have this sort of the, the, the iron fist inside the velvet glove type of type of deal for how the parties maintain control. All right, so those are sort of the, the, the three really significantly important <laughs> pillars in, in ma main, maintaining maintaining the party's rule. The fourth one, what was that? We just talked about it. I've had a. All right, thank you very much. So. 
the final element in all this game is that if you look at Communist Party history from 49 until today, the main source of instability uh, in China has been party factional fighting. So 1956, anti-rightist movement, 57, anti-rightist movement, the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, the Tiananmen Square were all caused or sparked by internal divisions within the party. And in 89, they really learned their lesson. They almost lost control because of their inability to actually come to a conclusion about how to deal with these massive protests that were rocking Beijing and many cities around the country. From that moment on until today, we have not seen significant, significant factional infighting. And even though in China right now, you have a relatively weak weakness at the top part of the government, the Standing Committee, the Politburo, and it's, it's China's premier leader, Hu Jintao, is, is, is significantly, probably uh, uh, unprecedentedly weak compared to Jiang Zemin or Deng Xiaoping or Mao Zedong before him. Nonetheless, and, and you do see the rise in China of the bureaucracies, whether it's the Ministry of Commerce or the People's Liberation Army, is important factions in, in fighting out for the, the sort of budgets and, and other types of influence. You do not see factionalism really affecting the party's hold on power. You don't see liberals popping up and calling for democratic change versus conservatives who are popping up and trying to stymie democratic change. You do not see that like you saw in 1989. And that there seems to be a much clearer sense that the party understands that if it doesn't hang together, it will hang separately. And that understanding is something that I think will probably be maintained well into the future. So. Uh, unlike in Egypt, where certain <clears throat> members of Mubarak's cabinet and also the military came to the conclusion that it was just untenable with this guy uh, and he had to go, you're not going to see that in China. Another difference, and an important difference uh, uh, between China and the Middle East, is that China is run by a system uh, and not by a family. And so it's different, in, for example, uh, from, from North Korea, also from uh, uh, Egypt, and also from Libya. Hu Jintao is not trying to put his son in power. And that's a significant difference as well. It's, it's, it's the organization which runs it. And the organization's interests are really uh, key and dominant among, among all. So that's sort of just a little uh, outline as to as, as an argument of why we're not going to see this uh, happening in China. But like I said, I, I, I wanted to. to to start and also to finish with the proviso that anything is possible because the nature of the system in and of itself is, is unstable. So they've won 20 some odd years of stability. It's unclear whether they're going to be able to win 20 more years uh, for other, uh, because of other tensions happening in the country. So with that, I'd like to sort of entertain your questions and we could have a dialogue in, in, this, in this small room with lots of you. <coughs> Sir, you mentioned that the political system is fundamentally uh, unstable. Uh, could you talk to more uh, to some specific, uh, you know, uh, factors that lead to this, like maybe peasant revolts? Uh, um, and as you know, it's actually, it's, I, I think that the party is, has stopped releasing the number of mass incidents. They stopped it in 2009, maybe, uh, because the number was just going up increasingly. I mean, and, but the significant percentage each year. So I think they stopped at about 100,000. But uh, the very good, and, and mass incidents being anything from 100 some odd people or more, often engaged in violence. There is a, and the main form of the, uh, the main reason for so much instability in China has to do with the land grabs, where uh, a cabal of business interests and the party will take land away from peasants and then do an industrial development project or a housing project and basically toss people out off their land without any, and any uh, compensation. Um, that is one issue. Another issue is basically the whole problem of managing a, what is increasingly becoming a world-class economy by an organization that believes in restricting the free flow of information. And that tension is an enormously difficult tension for them to work out. Another issue is how to allocate capital ration, rationally in a system that almost always picks winners and losers. right? And that is another tension that is going to be difficult for them to play out for the next 10, 10 some odd years. A third significant form of instability is their demographic trap that they're in. So China's demographics are, are lousy. Basically, it's the first country that's going to get 
poor, uh, get, 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 get old before it gets rich. Um, they're going to have a higher percentage of people above the age of 60 in about a decade or so than we do in the United States. They're going to have 100 million people over the age of 80. Um, and that's a very difficult situation to deal with when you don't have Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and we have them in the states, they're lousy, but at least we have them, the Chinese have just begun to set up these type of safety nets. And that's going to suck an enormous amount of money uh, out of their investments in high-speed rail, et cetera. So there's some, and then another tension, which is becoming a political issue, is the environmental problem. Um, because with the increasing wealth of my classmates and, and, and their buddies, and there's you know, maybe a, a small number of 300 million people in the middle class, you have an increasing demand on society for decent drinking water, clean air for your kids, and a kind of a decent environment for them to grow up. And China can't provide that yet. And that tension is another significant tension uh, in, in, in stressing the system. And the other problem is that because there is no civil society in China, every problem becomes political, right? I mean, every problem that you have from a car accident up, you know, I mean, literally there was a car accident in, in, in uh, was it Hebei or Hubei? Yeah, uh, Hebei, where the son of a senior police officer ran over two girls, killed two women, killed one, broke the leg of another. It became a massive political issue in China because he, as he drove off, leaving the scene of the crime, he said, I'm Li Gang's son. Uh, you know, Li Gang being a local police boss. And it became this enormous story in China. And, and you know, that's a hit and run thing in the United States. But in China, it became something that everyone talked about. And the whole expression of I, I'm Li Gang's son has now been entered in the Chinese vocabulary that people you know, tell each other as a joke. Um, so that's another issue, that because of the lack of civil society and the lack of, of, of a, an independent judiciary, every issue can be become a political issue that, that speaks badly to the Communist Party. So that's kind of my, my, my sense of fundamentally it's an unstable system. suppressing the extent to which they're uh, cracking down on protests and a lot of times in fact you don't really know the extent of Tiananmen if anything. How are they deterring their citizens from well, um, first, they have a very advanced censorship apparatus on the, on, on the Internet. So the Internet in China is, is one sort of a double-edged sword because it's allowed for an enormous amount of information to come into the country, but it's also allowed for the security services to increase their abilities to monitor you know, your email, my email, his email, et cetera. So it has an end. They also have an army of bloggers who blog on behalf of the government, even though they're out there acting as some type of independent person. But in reality, they're being paid for by the Communist Party. Um, and so uh, we, we've, I think we've heard that story before elsewhere, but that's not the point. Um, so, so they have, and, and the other thing is, when there are, for example, like, let's speak about what's happening recently. There are small demonstrations now modeled after the quote unquote Jasmine Revolution happening in Beijing happening in Shanghai. But the government is basically now shutting down parts of Beijing, sending out uh, large, very large street sweepers, beating up foreign journalists in order to stop any of this stuff from, from metastasizing and growing too large. And we're talking about crowds of maybe 20 people in several cities. And the government has basically put this massive clamp down. It's throwing dozens of uh, scores of people in jail around the country in order to deal with what, you know, they look at this issue as uh, a, a, um, an existential issue. Whereas in the States, 20 people on the street corner, it's not an issue for us. But the, the government there is being, being, like I said, with the security services giving, being, being given free reign to crack down as harshly as they can. Um, that's, that's another example. That said, you know, when you talk to people about Tiananmen Square in China and you show them the, that the Tank Man picture, you know, most people have no idea what you're talking about. But, and, and that's also part of the security philosophy, which is to deny their people information about what happened in the past as well, and to wipe out that history. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of a tragedy in a way, but China is one of the only countries where I have, have begun to 
living there, I, be, I began to believe that perhaps history is expungible in some ways. Um, talking to young people in Beijing University about what happened in, ten, in 1989, uh, you know, talking to them in the early 2000s, and they had no knowledge of it whatsoever, which was sort of bizarre, but nonetheless, it's, 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 it's the case. Uh. What sort of runs did you have with the security apparatus? Um, you know, when I was in China, we, there were very strict rules that, 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 that foreign journalists had to follow. So if I wanted to leave Beijing, I had to have the approval of a government bureau in the town I wanted to go to to do reporting. And I never asked for the approval. Um, <laughs> just because everyone in China always breaks the rules all the time. I'm talking about the Chinese, right? Because the rule, if you did things by the rules, by the book in China, you really couldn't make any money, right? And there's a lot of being, money being made in China, so everyone breaks the rules. And so I figured I, I might as well have the same attitude towards my work in China as they had towards they were, their work. And so I would go to a place, do my reporting with the unofficial people, and then I would come back, and then I would call up the official people on the telephone saying, hey, you know, I heard about this, and, you know, can you give me a comment? And in the beginning, I would always get, you know, I'm not clear, I'm not approved. But by the end of my tour, um, I was there for six years, people would talk about issues. Um, but they would never invite you back, you know, for the interview. Um, uh, and so, and I had significant run-ins, especially uh, oriented around uh, peasant demonstrations with local authorities. But it was a cat and mouse game. Um, and you know, they would track your cell phone and you'd turn off your cell phone. Um, you know, um, I had a very good driver who wasn't working for the, you know, the state security people. And, and literally, if you're in a province and there was a problem, literally driving into the other pro into a, a neighboring province would, would solve your problem, like you know, getting across state lines. It was that simple in some ways. Because there wasn't that much communication between the police in this province with that province. They almost always had to communicate through Beijing because it's a, cent it's a centrally oriented system, right? So I would like, if I'm going from you know, Shandong uh, down to Jiangsu province, you know, and I'm trying to get across the, the provincial line in order to kind of escape a problem that I've been reporting on in Shandong, they wouldn't kind of call their buddy across the river to help them out. They would have to like call Beijing. And so in that sense, we would often just sort of report on a local issue, go to the next province, and we'd be quote unquote safe. Now, when you got back to Beijing, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs might call you in and like shake their finger at you. but. It was done then with a nod and a wink that it was kind of OK. I think now the attitude towards foreign journalists is a lot harsher than it used to be. It has to do with the rise of nationalism, their, the belief of many Chinese youth that we totally, the Western press totally distorts the reporting on China. Whereas then, I think there was a friendlier attitude of the average Chinese and, and even the Ministry of Foreign Affairs towards our, towards our stuff. So I think the attitude of the young Chinese has changed, and that's actually forced everyone to kind of to lean a little bit uh, more on us and be more be more harsh uh, harsher on us than, than than in the past. What is the attitude of the young Chinese? Well, I mean, there's lots of them. So, um, but but there's there's a there's a general kind of there's sort of a cut it cut it, let's cut it in half to be simple that on foreign affairs. Among a cohort of 18 to 35-year-old males, because those are, those are the, they're, they're generally the ones who are online writing about foreign affairs-related stuff, it's kind of wacky nationalism 101. It's really crazy. Like, let's bomb Japan, teach America a lesson, you know, take what's right. You know, Mongolia, that's not a country. We used to have it as a province. You know, the Koreans were all, you know, um, I mean, it's kind of like this kind of weird, angry nationalism. Um, on foreign affairs issues. And it's like the government does something, you're weak, you know, you're giving into America, whatever, that kind of stupidness. All right, that's very prominent. But when you, when, they, when you take that kind of anger and you turn it on to domestic issues, it's like uh, there was a story a couple of years ago, like this official from Nanjing government was videotaped with a very nice watch on his wrist, right? This was 2009, late 2009. So the, the thing goes up on the Chinese version of YouTube, right? And it, it goes wild, like, who is this guy? He's at, he's at this level of, in the Nanjing government. He should be making, you know, whatever, $1,300 a month. And he's got a, you know, $250,000 watch on his wrist. Who is it? And they went, you know, ape, whatever. They went bat crazy about this thing. And the guy's in jail now. 
um, because of corruption, right? He was investigated. And so on things in, involving internal issues of unfairness, um, the Lee Gong case, you know, my daddy's Lee Gong, that went completely. And it's the same guys, the 18 to 35 cohort, who are driving that debate that are also driving the debate about being weak on America and not blowing up Japan. Um, and so it has, it has two faces. And so one of the issues that, 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 that I, I kind of noticed in China, and that it's difficult to explain to Americans in a way, is that that ultranationalism on foreign issues has this kind of pro-democratic face when it's faced when it, when it looks or anti kind of communist party thing when it's turned on to domestic issues in China right and so one of the reasons why the government is afraid of for example anti-japanese demonstrations is they they might encourage them a little bit but they know that at any point in that demonstration some guy the same guy who's shouting down with Japan can flick his placard around and start yelling down with the Communist Party. And it makes total sense to that guy, and the Chinese understand that. And whereas we're thinking, you know, you're, an, you're a nationalist crazy, I just don't want to even talk, talk to you, but actually the, 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 coin, the this different side of that coin in the Chinese context is also, can also become very quickly anti-party. And another thing is that the Chinese sort of political culture has this history of using one issue to deal with another issue, right? So, you know, criticize China for its behavior, its weak behavior in the face of America. But what you're really doing is actually you're criticizing the Communist Party for what it's doing in China. But you can't do that because if you did that, you'd go through that door, right? And so that's another, a lot of stuff is done in code. And so when we look at it, you know, we're like, they hate America. But actually, no, they kind of oppose the party. But they're saying that in order to say this because they can't say this. And that's part of the sort of the kabuki that's in China that, with, that foreign reporters and people who live in China have to try to figure out and separate. It's difficult. It's a challenge. So, in the back. Uh, in regard to like, personal freedoms, what kind of uh, view do you think China has on religion and such things like the church? So, I, you know, they, they have a totally wacky policy on religion. Let's just talk about Christianity. Um, uh, and it's, it often depends on who is the county boss. Um, if the county boss is a, is a former PLA officer, it's generally very hardcore. If he's a local guy, uh, it's generally a lot softer. Uh, and also, it also depends on what the local church is doing. Because in China, right, you have the house churches, and then you have the officially sanctioned churches. And sometimes the guy who runs the house church is also in the officially sanctioned church. Sometimes that guy and the officially sanctioned church guy get along. Sometimes they hate each other. And so it's a, an incredibly messy system. And the religious, as a, a re, religious Affairs Bureau, which are these mandarins in Beijing, which are kind of supposed to run the policy, don't really have a clear idea of what they want to do because the government is unsure. Because they're facing this immense growth in the number of Christians. Um, it estimated between 50 to 60 million Christians in China right now. Um, and it's, and it's, the, the, the growth has just really exploded over the last 15 to 20 years, partially because of this moral vacuum in China where you have millions of people looking for something to believe in, right? You know, Mao shows up in 49 and says, all your, you know, your old Chinese culture is horrible. Uh, and then, you know, basically launches an assault on Chinese culture for the last decade of his rule. He then is, you know, dies, and then Deng comes in and says, well, remember all that communism stuff? Forget about it. We're a one-party state, but with, you know, capitalist characteristics. Let's make money. And so the Chinese have been whipsawed, and now there's, for many of them, there's been this search for, for something to believe in. So you have Falun Gong exploding and becoming very popular, and then the party cracking down and you know killing hundreds of their believers you have buddhism exploding and really growing in 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 influence at the same time you have local governments encouraging its development because if you can discover a a, a mountain that has kind of cosmic characteristics you can make a lot of money if you build a temple on that mountain and charge people 20 chinese renminbi to go there um, and then the same is true with Christianity. Uh, it, but it actually, interestingly, the Christians don't charge people entrance to, uh, money to, to, to go into their church. Um, so 
uh, it, it's a very difficult uh, and complicated issue because it's it's so the policies are so varied. That said, I think the parties kind of not really. Under Jiang Zemin, it had a much mellower policy on religion than it has under Hu Jintao, partially because Hu is just a lot weaker, and when the guy at the top is weaker, that the bureaucracies involved in uh, monitoring these things become stronger and squeeze tighter. And so Jiang was kind of like the copper age of religion in China, and this guy's kind of pushed them back towards the, the stone age a little bit, uh, partially because I think he just has, has, has less influence. Um, that said, no longer do th th does the Chinese Communist Party believe that uh, you either are a believer or patriotic Chinese. They're beginning to kind of come around to the idea that you can be both a believer and a patriotic Chinese. Um, but that said, as you probably read in the news, they have no relations with, with the Vatican. Um, but, but, but interestingly enough, I think Catholicism is not an important religion anymore in China. It's really evangelical Christianity, and it's very, very big. You see it in many cities, uh, specifically in northern China and then down into Zhejiang province. Come on, one of the best colleges in the whole nation. <laughs> I'm curious to ask more about the, um, the screening and the censorship in China. Um, recently, they started to block you know, all forms of video chat and, and forms of external communication to outside of countries. Um, Not all forms. Or many. Yeah. Forms. Yeah. And um, however, I, I know that you know I know many Chinese people studying here in the United States, uh, and they're going to bring back stuff to to China. Right. And you know, recently, you know, on on, on their Google on, ba on Baidu, right. They, they don't say Google to bring attention to it. They use the word like Google or some, right. some kind of code or some pun. Right. You know, so how much internal stress can they support before the, there's going to be some form of internal explosion? Well, I think that the the um, the, the punning and that all you know Huntsman what Huntsman's name was blocked right the the ambassador's name was blocked. So. Right now, they're going through uh, a, a sort of this spasm of censorship, um, and uh, the sort of the smart kids figure out ways around it, uh, and then that kind of is spread out through the web, and then everyone starts using it, and it becomes sort of a joke. Um, but that's kind of always been a cat and mouse game between, and you know, even before the internet in China, between. You know, the people who are trying to find out information and trying to live in a relatively free and open way, and the government which was trying to restrict that. And the internet has made it more difficult for the government to do that. That said, the government is really not so much interested in you, who are a smart Chinese guy who can find out everything, and they're much more interested in like the, 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 the layer of people below you, of people who are basically satisfied uh, and you know, with the censorship. And that's a significant portion of Chinese society uh, still. And that's what they're targeting. And so the people who will make fun of them, get around it, you know, get a, a virtual private network and get, get, you know, jump over the firewall, they, they understand that they've lost those people already. But the reason they do this is not for those people. It's to make it more difficult for those people. But it's also just really to, 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 to restrict that information to only the, really the, the, the very elite of this society. Because they're not so much worried about you, but they're really worried about that level of people below you who aren't as educated, who aren't as sort of forward-thinking, and and that's that's what they block, and that's what they block, because that's 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 the audience they're really trying to control, and to that for that audience, the Chinese internet is actually an incredible thing. I mean, it has an enormous amount of information, you know, scantily clad girls, you know, sort of the love affairs of the latest Hong Kong film star, all that kind of stuff, and it's it's very appealing and it satisfies the, the many uh, many things that the average Chinese person would want. Um, and it's the, the people who can jump over, they're really not concerned, unless you start to go through that door, in which case you're going to go to jail. Um, you will. I mean, that's that kind of formula. Is there regarding the most recent incident with the Ambassador Huntsman and the censorship? Right. Um, what's your take on that? Do you think that he was really shopping along too soon with his family, or do you think he was a little bit curious about what was going on? Well, I mean, the other line was that he was walking from his residence to the embassy. But that <laughs> is like. His residence is in Jianwai, where I used to live, and it would—it's it, just a huge thing, you know. So I don't know. I—I right? I, I just don't know. Um, there's a certain coyness to it all. Uh, so.
You know, it could be, it could be. I mean, Wang Fujing is not, it's not unusual for people to be taking a stroll on Wang Fujing, right? But to walk from the residence to your embassy, is, that's a long walk. Yeah, it's many miles. So, who knows? Right. I don't want to accuse him of lying. Time for one more question. We don't get much information about North Korea. Just briefly, <coughs> we heard a bit that there really had a major famine. One of the things where well, why doesn't the Western nations send food? And the comment was, well, when the Western nations send food, it's used to feed the army and it doesn't trickle down. Now, that country is tightly run, I'm sure you can say that. But uh, it seems when the poor people reach a point, that's when revolution occurs. What do you see happening in the short term in North Korea? That's a really good question. I think that. We have to remember that 2012 is the 100th anniversary of the birth of uh, Kim Il-sung. And so 2012 is going to be the year where North Korea is going to be celebrating its glorious history. And so they have to stockpile food. I'm sorry that I'm a little cynical about this. They have to stockpile food. And so it makes a lot of sense for them to go out with their hands out, talk famine to stockpile food in order to bolster their regime next year. Um, on the whole revolution issue, you know, revolutions come generally as you increase expectations, and I don't really know what the expectations of the average North Korean is. I mean, things were getting a little bit better, and then they cracked down, and everyone lost their money. Um, so I, I can't, you know, again, I mean, talk about an unstable place. That place could blow up any second. Then again, it, people have been predicting that it was going to blow up any second for about 30 years. Um, I think China's policy on North Korea is fascinating, right? I mean. And people talk about China's policy on North Korea being, you know, they just don't want 250,000 refugees, you know, all that. But I think it has more to do with the fact that they have this really good buffer zone between them and South Korea. And they look at the history of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and they look at North Korea, and they think East Germany. Um, and it's an existential issue for them. And that's why they're bolstering North Korea to the, to the max right now. Um, and I think that the Chinese, at the end of the day, won't let North Korea fall because they really look at a united Korean peninsula as also something that would be significantly affect their security posture, especially a Korean peninsula that united uh, uh, with China opposing that unification because that would, that would give America a friend forever um, and really complicate China's, China's, China's future.